G'day again. Hope everyone's doing well. Today I want to just discuss a few things, um, make some comparisons. As you can see, I've got some things on the board there. The what I'm going to be talking about today is keeping ourselves in the love of God. Um, it's Jude 121. It's going to be the main scripture that's the central theme, what I'm going to be talking about. But as you can see, I'm going to be making a comparison between false faith and the faith once delivered to the saints, as which is also spoken of in June. So if we turn to June, Jude, chapter 1, verse 1, we read, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God, the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. So in that first verse, clearly he's writing to those who are sanctified by God, you know, set apart unto holiness and preserved in Jesus Christ. Of course, in the spirit of his life, as I say often in my videos, in the spirit of life in Jesus Christ, uh, an abiding manifest state. Then he writes, Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, so there's only one salvation, it's the common salvation to all, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So I've put up here these two sides here. We've got the faith once delivered that Jude was referring to and the false faith. Um, under the false faith, grace is turned into lasciviousness, which refers to unbridled lust. Um, grace, as we see, written elsewhere, like in Titus um, 2, 11 and 12, where it says, the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, to live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age. See, that's what grace teaches. Grace, God's influence upon us, um, his benefit for us when we abide in that, his graciousness, it's all inclusive of that. So I've got the two comparisons here. We've got the unbridled lust and lust crucified, basically. So I'll continue if we turn to Titus chapter 1 verses 15 and 16. It says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They, press that the, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So here I've got the, these people, their mind is defiled, and their conscience is defiled. And the opposite of that, of course, is a pure mind and a pure conscience. So in the faith once delivered, the genuine Christians are going to have a pure mind and a pure conscience. And from that, they're going to produce deeds that are done in God because it's going to flow for, it's going to be brought forth out of that purity. But the defiled, the works, their works are going to deny God because their works are being brought forth out of a defiled mind and a defiled conscience. See, this is really getting to what real salvation really is. It's a salvation from sin, not in it. So if we um, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and I'm just going to read from verses 1 through to verse 13 in 2 Timothy. And uh, he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. So there, in that first sentence, We've got the grace that is in Jesus Christ, you know, in the spirit of life in Jesus Christ, Romans 8.2. It's always good to keep that in mind because it's, you know, Jesus said, abide in me, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll abide in you. And we've got to abide in him, abide in the vine. And otherwise we can't bring forth fruit because he is, it's his grace. It's in him that we are empowered and have God in us. And then it, it's God working through us. He wills and to do of his good pleasure working through us because we abide in the spirit and out of that we produce a genuine righteousness hence we're made the righteousness of God in him 2 Corinthians 5 21 so I'll continue in 2nd Timothy chapter 2 in verse 2 and he goes and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, 
yet is he not crowned except he strive law lawfully? So there's a proper way to go about things, just like a someone striving for the mastery is in some sort of art or an athlete or whatever it is. They've got to strive lawfully. That means they've got to be diligent and apply themselves to the proper way of obtaining the mastery. And it's the same with Christianity. We've got to abide in the spirit and we've got to walk the walk, be a doer, not a hearer only. That's why, you know, it says that um, lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the implanted word that can save its soul. Um, be not hearers only of the word, but doers. You know, if you doers of the word and not hearers only, you're deceiving yourself. So there's going to be that dynamic of working together with God. And in order to receive the implanted word, receive that word in us, we have to lay aside rebelling or rejecting that word. Something that I, um, something that's very obvious if you really think about it. Like how can you receive an instruction and then reject that instruction at the same time? And it's, it, that's how it is with God. God is calling us to come and walk a certain way and abide in him so he can work in us. But if we're against that in rebellion, then nothing happens. And that's why Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, that, you know, um, be, you know, be workers together with God, lest you receive the grace of God in vain. So we can receive the grace of God in vain or to no um, effectual outcome, no transformation of our heart. If we're, if, if, if we receive it, but don't work with it, it's, it's like being given, um, God presents us with something that is useful. And then, but we don't put it to use and then it's done no effect. It's like a farmer, if they're given a tractor to plow the field, but then they don't use the tractor, they've received the tractor to no working effect. And the outcome is maybe if they had a, a certain amount of grain or something to harvest or to plow in or whatever it is with, with the tractor, they're unable to do it in time because they haven't utilized the tools that they have. They've gone about it in some other way. So I'll continue here. Um, in verse 6, it says, The husbandman that laboureth must be first partaker of the fruits. Which is interesting, like Jesus Christ was the first fruits. He, you know, he led the way and he did it first. And that's a good example for us. And then, he goes, then Paul goes, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. So we've got to die with Christ. So if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. You know, we die with him, we die to sin, and then we're raised up to life, the abundant life that's in him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. See, we can deny Christ by what we do. Because like, like I said here, you know, works done in God or works that uphold God are, are righteous works done through grace, through faith, by faith through grace, by grace through faith. Um, but works that deny God is in this. But uh, of course, it goes on to say that um, in verse 13, if we believe not, Yet he abideth faithful, he cannot die and deny himself. Because God is who God is. God is real, he's the, he's the truth. Um, Jesus is the, the way, the truth, and the life. And um, he can't deny himself because he as he is. Now, if we're unfaithful, he's still faithful in the sense that he is who he is. We've just cut ourselves off from, from that. So we can believe not, but he abideth faithful. But see, the way to life is to abide faithfully with him. So we come and we're united with him and we're in agreement with him and operating in accordance with how things should operate. Because the way of God is the proper way. And we know this if we're really honest with ourselves. If we look at the world, we know that righteousness works. It really does. We know that love works. It's a principle that just brings um, good things. And that's when, when you look at everything that Jesus taught, like in the Sermon on the Mount, it's like people abided in what he taught there, things would be so different in this world. You wouldn't have the lying, the cheating, the stealing, the dishonesty, um, the broken families. You wouldn't have that because people would genuinely love one another. And out of that love, it would produce good things. You'd still have some accidents and um, sicknesses and things like that. Um, but you wouldn't have the, um, the societal ills that we see in the world today. And the reason we have the societal ills in the world today is because of sin. It's because people have rejected the light and they have chosen to walk in darkness because in some manner they're compromised in their hearts. 
Because if they weren't compromised in their hearts, they'd hear the truth and they'd yield to it. And that's why in um, John, it's written that Jesus said, you know, this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, that men love darkness rather than the light, and now they would not come to the light lest their deeds be reproved. But he who comes to the light, it says, um, you know, those people, their deeds are, you know, to see that their deeds are done in God. And that's what, what we want to do. If we come to God through the genuine experience into the genuine Christianity by really following him, being hearer and doer of the word and yielding our heart to him, having truly actually repented where we've put off our old man. So um, I'll continue in Jude. We'll go back to Jude. Um, starting in verse 17, I'll read 17 and 18, where it says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. And of course, you've got Judy referring to what Peter said, because in Peter, in um, 2 Peter 3.3, 3, it says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. So he's recalling the words spoken by the apostles, those who were taught directly by Jesus. And they're the words that we really ought to pay attention to and really believe what they say. Like, look at them and not not just jump to proof texts under this like false Christian, under this false theology that a lot of people believe where they just sort of pull certain texts which they build their whole foundation on and they don't compare Scripture with Scripture and they don't reason through it honestly in their hearts. And that's a real big problem today. And this is why I make a video like this, trying to reason with people to really consider what the Bible actually teaches. And I'll bring out a lot of scriptures that you just generally don't hear a lot because they completely contradict the common theology of the day. So now if we go to um, Jude, oh, again we're in Jude, we'll continue from 19 verse to 23. And at first it's all about it says, These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So you can see a contrast there. There's those who don't have the Spirit, and there's those that do have the Spirit. And I've got like um, this on the board here with the no Spirit, and there's the Spirit. And you can see which side. See, the faith once delivered to the saints have the people in the Spirit, but the, the false faith is no Spirit. Now, the false faith is religious. There's religion in it, but it's, it's a dead religion because it's just an outward form with no spirit in it. So it's just, um, it's, it can be rules and regulations. It can have a manifestation of appearing like holiness, but there's no real truth in it. So continue on here. Um, so in verse 21, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And I've, so, th so this is, this is the theme passage that really I wanted to look at, you know, just keep yourselves in the love of God. And that's something that's like what Jude is imploring people to do. He's like, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, because he's very merciful for our past. And he goes, unto eternal life. And then he goes, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. See, the flesh spots the garment. And that's, of course, walking in accordance with the flesh, like yielding to the lustful desires of the flesh, not having them crucified. That's what the Bible teaches. So um, I'm going to go to Deuteronomy 6. And the reason I want to go to Deuteronomy 6 and read a little bit is um, we're going to see how keeping the commandments is an expression of the love of God. And I'm not talking about um, keeping Torah or anything like that. Um, that's, that's, that's legalism. I'm talking about keeping the commandments of the words of Jesus, what he taught, and walking in his way. And we see a pattern of this in the Old Testament with the letter of the law, how that was presented. Because remember, they didn't have the spirit like under the New Covenant. The, the law wasn't written upon the heart and in the mind um, as it is under the New Covenant. So if we turn to Deuteronomy 6 and start in verse 1, it says, now these, are the, the, now these are the commandments, the statutes and the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. And you might do them in the land, whither you go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, and keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. So it's like for their benefit, if they, if they did these things, it would benefit them physically. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, 
that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. See, why would God command this to them if they couldn't do that then? Like They could do that then, but they could only do it in the sense of following the letter of the law that they had before them. Um, they didn't have the experience of the Spirit, they didn't have the blood of Christ, so they couldn't have that full reconciliation where their, all their works were done through the Spirit. And that's what they lacked, but they could still be obedient and, and loving towards God. It's just that they wouldn't have experienced the connection, that union that we can experience now under the New Covenant. And that, that's the real difference because we have the, the blood of Christ and the, the real, we can enter into covenant with God via the blood and have that purging of our past where, it, where it's totally put on Christ and done away with once and for all and then we're disconnected from it. Of course we remember it and abhor and, you know, and, and realise the shame of how we lived before. But it's put to death so that we can experience the new life, the abundant life in Christ. So um, in verse 6 it says, And these words which I command thee to this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. In other words, all the time. It's, it's a way of life. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, you know, what, what, what you do, and thou shalt be as frontlets between thine eyes. You know, it's, it's what you think, what's in your mind. You know, put on, like in the New Testament, it's like a shadow of that. Put on the mind of Christ. And so we've got that. Keep that in mind, how there's to keep his commandments is to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 22 and look at what Jesus taught on love. So if we start in verse 37 to 40, it says, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Just like what we read in Deuteronomy. And he says, This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. See, see the love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbour as yourself is, is the foundation principle of all the law, because the law, thou shalt do this, thou, you know, um, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not lie, honour your father and mother, that is all to proceed out of love. It's not to proceed out of a rule that's set on a page, no, it's to proceed out of love, and that's why it's the foundation. If you are living your life in accordance with that foundation, then you don't need those rules and regulations, because those rules and regulations would be naturally produced as a fruit of love. So now let's read what Paul, turn to Romans chapter 13, and we'll, we'll read verses 8 to 10. And this is what Paul taught on love. And he says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And this is why Paul would write in um, 1 Corinthians 13, 6, that, you know, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth. And that's what we hear, see, love does not rejoice in this, and it won't produce this. Love rejoices in the truth, and it will produce this. And this is what we're to keep ourselves in the love of God. This is what we're to keep ourselves in, keep ourselves in this. Keep ourselves in a love that works no ill because we love God with all our heart, soul, and mind and love our neighbour as ourself. If we turn to Galatians chapter 5, we're going, I'm going to read verses 4 to 6 where it says, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you is justified by the law, ye have fallen from grace. So we can't turn to rules and regulations to seek true righteousness because it is merely a, a reflection of what righteousness should look like. But keeping rules and regulations in and of themselves is not righteousness. It's just, it's just a doing. Genuine righteousness is to abide in the love of God, out of which the fruit of what those rules and regulations would look like is produced in our lives. As I said before, you're not going to steal, kill, um, bear false witness, or just, you're not going to, love works no ill. It's such a very simple thing. So we continue here, you know, you've fallen from grace if you seek to be justified by the law. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by, hope, by 
faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. See, in Jesus Christ, you know, abiding in Him, the only thing of value is a faith that works by love. And that's one of the... Um, it's one of the aspects of what genuine faith is. It, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an operating principle that works by love. It's not a passive trust or a mental assent in your mind. No, it's an abiding thing where you see God and, and you, you love him and you abide in him. And that's genuine faith. So um, I'm going to go to Romans 5.5. 5, and this is really important because it talks about how it's the Holy Spirit that sheds the love of God abroad in the heart. And this is very clear that see when we yield to God and to his spirit it, it just brings that work and that love of God is manifested in us and then it works out of us and that's why it produces you know the works done or deeds that uphold God works done in God so Romans 5 5 says and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us and remember the scripture says you know the, the Holy Ghost is given to all those that obey him and that, that simply means that those who yield themselves to him, so when we give ourselves over to God, wholeheartedly having really repented, then his Holy Spirit is able to abide in us because we're no longer defiled, because there's no rebellion in us. The, oh, the old man, the, 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 the defiled mind and the defiled conscience is, is, is put off. And we come, we come to God and then through the blood, you know, we can have our conscience is purged of dead works and all our works become alive through the Spirit. You know, as, as you can see the reference in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, where it talks about, you know, that the letter kills, but it's the spirit that brings life. And oh, what an abundant, abundant life that it brings to us. Um, in 1 John 4, 7, I'm going to read here. It says, 1 John chapter 4, verse, starting in verse 7. It said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. See, the new birth brings us into a state of love, not, not sin, not this, but into this, where we can keep ourselves in this. Um, you know, and yeah, like, like I was reading there, so, for, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. See, see, to know love or genuine love is to genuinely know God, because God is love. And he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That's in verse 8. Then it says, And this was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. See, why did God send his only begotten Son into the world? So we could live through him. Not just trust in him, but actually abide in him and live through him. And he live, put on his mind and his spirit into us while we walk. This is the quickening spirit, remember. Um, so in verse 10, it says, Here in his love, that, not that we love God, see, God made the first move, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. And, and what a wonderful example that is, because as Christians in the world, other people aren't going to love us, but we can love them first and influence them to come into the faith by loving them. Um, so he's to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved and propitiation is... Just, it's a means of expiating sin. Um, you'll see that there's, there's a, a word that's a derivative of that is used in Hebrews that refers to mercy seat. But I'm going to make a, a video on that that will examine these words and definitions. There's a lot of confusion around that, but um, I'll leave that to another video. I'd be here quite a bit longer than I want to be today. So it continues, it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. So that's how we ought to act. No man hath seen God at any time. It's God is spirit. You, know, you can't see him literally with the eyes if we love one another god dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us so if we love one another god dwelleth in us because that love proceeds from god and his love is perfected in us hereby know that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us his spirit so he gives us his spirit that sheds the love of god abroad in our heart romans 5 5 again and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. You know, Saviour through abiding in Him. Because through Him. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in Him, and He in God. And remember, the confession with the mouth proceeds from believing in the heart. Like in Romans 10, it says, we believe, 
um, we believe with the heart unto righteousness, but confession is made with the mouth. And um, I think I mentioned in my previous video how um, Jesus, you know, he taught that it's not what goes into the mouth of the man that defiles him, but what comes out. And so it's out of like a wicked heart that precede adulteries, murders, lying, and all that sort of thing. That's what Jesus taught. But it's out of a pure heart, obviously, if you simply reverse things and think about it, it's out of a pure heart that produce godly conduct. And so that's why um, it's talking about, you know, he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. And so, and, and like I was saying, we have the, you know, you, you believe with the heart unto righteousness. It's a heart that is really yielded to God and believes, believes the truth of it. I mean, truly believes the truth of it and then abides in that. And then it's from that heart that is set that way, that a genuine confession can come out of the mouth, confessing Christ unto salvation. And not, not an honouring him with his lips only, but the heart is far from me. No, an honouring from the mouth that proceeded out of the heart. Just think about that. So then um, in verse, we'll go to 16 again. It says, and when, oh, verse 12, that's what I was up to. And we have known and believed that, that the love that God hath to us, God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. See how we're in agreement with God? If we come into this, if we abide in, in, in the spirit of life in Jesus Christ, where the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in those who walk after the spirit. See, we come... Our, 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 our nature, the way we are, comes into union with God and we agree with him. We're, op we're operating in accordance with the ways of God, which is the way of love. And that's what real salvation is. That's what God is calling us into. And, and, if, and if, we're not, if we're not as he is, you know, if not as, so, as he is, so are we in this world. If we're not that, then we don't have boldness in the day of judgment. Rather, we're under condemnation because we're not abiding in the spirit of his life. See, this is what the... The false church has so wrong because they don't understand that salvation is from sin. It's, it's a manifest experiential state of knowing God and knowing love and abiding in that and walking in that. And that's why there's no sin in salvation. You know, like I say, say sure we might fall short in ignorance because we're, we, none of us have perfect knowledge or understanding. And so we can make mistakes or make a, a, a rash judgment about something or have a form of false conclusion. Um, but there is no will, there's no ill intent. We, we don't act selfishly for, for gain. That's out of the question. You know, so the, that's why the scriptures talk about, you know, there's sins unto death. Because all those things, you look at them and they're malicious. You know, they're, they're all for gain. They're walking after just to serve the flesh. So I'll continue here. Um, so there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts, casteth out fear. Because love hath taught, because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And that's just a basic principle there. If, 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 if you say that you love God, and therefore the love of God abides in you, how can you hate your brother? You can't. So if you're hating your brother, there's something wrong there and you need to really examine your heart and come to that knowledge of the truth through a genuine godly sorrow that works through repentance unto a genuine salvation where you can experience the faith that purifies the heart, Acts 15, 9. And then I, we continue here, it says, And this commandment, this is verse 21 in 1 John chapter 4, And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. You know, going back to the Deuteronomy, what we read earlier. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. See, it's not grievous to do the right thing. Not at all, because we ought to, if, if we're genuine Christians, we love the right thing. Because it's right. It, it's a joy to do the right thing and then to be a light to the world, to bring others to a knowledge of what is right. For whatsoever is born of God, this is for, um, 1 John 5, verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 
See, a faith that works by love, love that works no, will, no ill, overcomes the world. And we're crucified to the world. Like, like what Paul said, you know, he, he, through, through Christ, he was crucified to the world and the world was crucified to him. So he, he walked in a faith that works by love, not working any ill. So he loved God with all his heart, soul and mind and his neighbour as himself. And he, his life manifested that. And his walk manifested that. And that's how he lived. And that's how we're to live all, also. He's our example, like it, like it says in Scripture. So if we turn to John chapter 15 and read, uh, we'll start at verse 9. So this is the Gospel of John chapter 15, verse 9. It says, as the, this is Jesus speaking. It says, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. So continue in my love, keeping ourselves in the love of God. Same thing. And if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So it's if we keep his words, if we keep his doctrine, if we keep what he taught, if we abide in that and do that and live in that, then you know we will abide in his love. And um, you know his, his love will abide in us because it will be manifested in us. We will know God and be in union with God. Because these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. So yeah, joy is, is fulfilled when we, when we walk and abide and, and we know God. It really is. There's, there's nothing like it in this life because it, it defines our life and who we are. It defines our purpose. And we have a real reason to live and be the best we can be every day in all that we do. And then Jesus said, um, you know, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So we have to love one another in the same way that he loved us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So you remember, you know, Jesus poured out his soul unto death through his whole life and then through offering himself on the cross. And, and even more than that, he did it for his enemies, because he died for everyone, for the world, those who didn't love him. You know, he died for us while we were yet sinners, as I think Paul said. And so his, his death on the cross really declared that righteousness of God, as it says in um, Romans 3, um, 24 to 26, or 25 and 26. He goes, Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant not knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. See, that's the relationship that Jesus wants with us. He wants to be a friend and, and we have to be in agreement with him and abide and walk in him. And if we go to verse 16 and 17, John 15, it says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you, of course, he's speaking specifically to his disciples there, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So that they bring forth fruit, and the fruit should remain. We ought to be that fruit that, that brought forth through, through their word. These things I command you, that you love one another. See, love is just the central theme of what Jesus taught. It really is. You just go through all the gospel. It's all about the love of God. A real, genuine, pure love. And that's what he's calling us into. If we turn to First Peter chapter 2, and I'll read verses 21 to 25. And um, it says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. It's pretty self-explanatory. He left us an example that we follow him. So, to, you know, as he loved us, we're to love him. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So that's the example. Doing no sin, no guile found in the mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled on again. See, when he was reviled, he didn't revile back. That's how we're to be. And when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. So he just committed himself to God. And that's what we're to do. We're to commit ourselves to God. If we're wrongly treated, we're to let it go and just commit ourselves to God. We're to love our neighbor. We're to love our enemies. Um, then it says in verse 24 who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree that we being dead to sins see he bore our sins on that tree that we can die to sin so we put our sins upon him and our old self is put to death with him and that way we can be raised up with him the new man in the new life according to the spirit being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed 
See, we are healed by his stripes when we suffer with him. And we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a moment here. He goes, For ye were as sheep going astray, you know, going the wrong way, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So he's the shepherd and bishop of our souls. He's, 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 he's the saviour of our souls. He's the one who looks after us and we're the sheep and we follow him wherever he goes. And through doing that, our soul is preserved. Um, in First Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, see, he suffered for us in the flesh, like I was just reading as an example, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, see, the same mind that he was suffering in, for he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. See, have you ceased from sin? You've only ceased from sin if you've suffered in the flesh, following Christ's example, and that's in dying to sin. Our old man is crucified with him. You know, the body of sin destroyed that we no longer serve sin, Romans 6, 6. But he that is dead, you know, we're dead to sin, but we're made alive to righteousness. Um, and then it, then it gives an explanation on that in verse 2 here. It says, that he no longer should live the rest of his time. See, we're no longer to live the rest of our time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. See, this is how we're to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. See, those who have not suffered with Christ, unbridled lusts. See, they've twisted grace, like in the false church system, into this provision which they receive, this legal swap they think happened on the cross, which is a myth. It, nothing like that happened. They're, they're, it's not in the scriptures. It, they read it into the scriptures through man's theology, which has been developed over the last 2,000 years with all these false teachings. And um, what these false teachings do is it turns grace into lasciviousness because the sin continues. And then because the mind is defiled and the conscience is defiled, they can't perceive it. And they, they, they're trapped in a lie. And very few people are coming out of the lie, but some are. And that's, you know, I'm trying to reason with people with what the scriptures actually teach. So people will come out of the lie, out of the deception and come to a, a real knowledge of the truth and escape the corruption that's in the world last and come to, you know, the real knowledge of Christ and walk in the spirit. And then they will, and, and do that, and you'll know God. That love of God will just be in you, and you'll know God, and you will have the greatest peace in your life. And your relationship with other people will be much better in the sense that you're not working will to, ill towards people anymore, and you'll be a light to them. Even though some people will be, you know, offended because you're not going along with the things that they like, like to do or say, um, but you're going to be that light in their life, and hopefully... You know, people will, will stop and think, and maybe when you're not around and think, well, there's something different about them. So, um, I'm going to go to Galatians, and it says, Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. So we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit here. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which is self-control. Against such there is no law. So there's no law needed if you have the fruit of the Spirit. Because it, the love fulfills the law and the fruit of the Spirit is, is, is love, it says here. Um, Romans 5.5 5 again. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God, which is the fruit of the Spirit, is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. See how it connects? Which is given unto us. See, there's a harmony in the Scriptures where the same theme is just taught everywhere. And when you really dig in there and dig and say, what's it really teaching? Everything just connects together. It's like all these dots and you just connect the dots and it comes alive. And when you live in accordance with it, it's actually comes alive in you. And that's, that's, that's what the, that's why it's so, um, abundant. That's I guess that's why Jesus would refer it, you know, when he spoke to that woman, you know, the abundant, abundant life, Have, you know, come to give life more abundantly, drink, drink of the water that he'll give and we won't go thirsty again, but we'll have life more abundantly. So in Romans 3.31, it says, Do we then make void the law through faith? You know, because through faith, and we're not under the law anymore. Does it, does it void the law? No, he, Paul writes that, God forbid, yea, we establish the law, because it establishes righteousness. Um, Romans 8.4 again, you know, those who walk after the Spirit, you know, um, the law is fulfilled in us, who, you know, walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. You know, that's, that's why Jesus gave himself for us. So, um, 
So Galatians 5.24 I've got here, you know, the one, the, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. See, those here have not done that. Those here have done that. Um, if we go to Hebrews 10.16, and this is where I've noted this down, because this is like really just where it sums up the new covenant, where it says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Well, how does God do that? Through the Holy Spirit, by shedding the love of God abroad in the heart, Romans 5.5. 5. You know, a love that works no ill, Romans 13.10. Um, um, if we turn to 1 John chapter 4 and we read verses 16 and 17. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we in, in this world. And so I've, I've mentioned this again here, because it's just so key to understand that um, abiding in the love of God is a manifest reality. It's, it's you know, like I watch a video of mine, I've got, you know, salvation is a positional or manifest. The professing Christian world has twisted salvation and redefined it into be positional, not a manifest state of abiding in the love of God. It's because there's no love there. It's a false religion, very deceptive, and it's hooked so many people. And because they think that the position is wrought by Jesus' finished work on the cross, they think that that's the gospel. And so then if you come to them and deny that and say, no, that's not what the cross is all about at all. The cross is about us partaking with him. The cross established the new covenant, but it's also we die with him. And it's through that we're released through the bondage of sin, released from the bondage of sin. And then because we're released from the bondage of sin, we're released from the bondage of condemnation because God is willing to forgive us our past transgressions through the blood of Christ, through the new covenant entering into him. Um, the blood, of course, represented him. You know, life is in the blood. Blood representing the spirit. And see, we abide in the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. And like in my last video, it's love covers a multitude of sins. See, God is willing to forgive our past if we commit and abide in his standard of righteousness. That's why God is just in forgiving sins, because it circumvents reoffending, because the love of God is, is made manifest in us. And that's why I think, you know, in, in Romans 3, it talks about how God is just in that Jesus' death on the cross. It declared the righteousness of God, that he might be just, and the justifier of those who, you know, have faith or believe in Jesus. It's very important to understand that and just read those scriptures and just think about it and just connect it all together in your, in, in your mind and how it works. Because nowhere does the scripture argue in favour of ongoing sin or some sort of sin repent cycle where you walk in the right way, then you sort of slip up in that. No, because a pure heart is pure. If your heart is really genuinely being purified, you stay in that state. A, a pure heart will not produce wrongdoing, not intentional. You know, like I say, you, you can mess up in the sense of something through ignorance, but not willful sin. It's out of the question, which is why in Hebrews it says, you know, if we willfully sin, no sacrifice remains. It's something I've talked about before. So we turn to Romans 8, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 4 right now. Um, this is very important. This, this, this is one of my favourite passages in Scripture. It says, there is, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So we've got the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ, how we walk. Um, For the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. See, it's that law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ when we abide in it. It sets us free from the law of sin and death. And what's the law of sin and death? Well, we'll turn to, I'll turn to James. And it's, it's really just the operating principle or a rule of the universe of how things, how things work. You depart from God and you depart from life. So James wrote that, um, But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, unbridled lust. See, so drawn away, given over to lust. But see, we escape the corruption in the world through lust. It's in um, Second Peter. Chapter, chapter 1, you know, those who have escaped the corruption of the world through lust, that we may partake in the divine nature. So, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. See, that's the law of sin and death. The wages of sin is death. Death in the present and death in the future. 
you know, eternally. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, through abiding in him. Not some position, not some package that you accept because, oh, I believe in Jesus. No, through entering into covenant with God through the blood, like it talks about in Hebrews um, 19 through 22, where the love of God is, is, you know, is, the law is written upon our heart. The love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. That's what has to happen. And, you know, so it's the spirit of life in Jesus Christ that circumvents the law of sin and death. And then it says, and for what the law could not do, because the law in and of itself cannot regulate the heart. It cannot transform the heart. The heart is transformed when we yield to God through the, by the spirit. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be filled in us, who what? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Those that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the passions and desires. And those who are Christ walk after the spirit. And because we walk after the spirit, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. We are made the righteousness of God in him. You know, and that's why those who are, you know, we're new creations. Like in um, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Look at that verse up. You know, all, all things are made new. So in, I'll continue in Romans, Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. See, so they're not having crucified the flesh. See, they're, they're still walking in according to the flesh. They're being governed by the flesh. They're like beasts, like animals. And they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. See, very self-explanatory. Really, what it's very simple. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And that's why we have to put the carnal mind to death in repentance. And then obtain that spiritual mind by giving ourselves over to Christ. And God's willing, his, his hands outstretched, he wants to put that spirit in us. But he won't do it if we're walking after the flesh, if we're carnal. If we're in rebellion to him. That's why it's repentance for remission. Repentance unto life. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. You've got to have that spirit of Christ. The spirit of his life. Abide in that. That sheds the love of God abroad in your heart. I know I've repeated a lot. But it's so essential to grasp these truths. Truths. Um, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are dead as not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So by walking after the spirit, we mortify the deeds of the body. That means we don't conduct our behavior and what we do in accordance with, with the flesh. We do it in accordance with the spirit. We're governed by the spirit. We're not governed by our, the base nature, so to speak, like an animal is, like a cat or a dog or a lion or whatever. No, we're governed as made in the image of God by the spirit of God. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So who's our father? It's God. And we're to be the children of God by abiding in his spirit and being led of him. So if we're not led of him, he's not our father. You know, and what did Jesus say to the Pharisees? He said that they were children of the devil because they, it, was though, it, was, it was his works that they did. They did evil. But see, when, if we're real Christians, we're not that. It's we do our deeds are done in God because we, 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 you know, we sacrifice, we suffer, our sin has ceased. The sheer spirit of God, of the, the spirit of shed the love of God abroad in our heart, and the righteousness of the law is established by our faith. And we continue on in verse sixteen, Romans chapter eight. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. See, there's, we we know God through this, that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God. See, we're His children, so we have an inheritance from God, because we're part of God's family for real in the spirit. And joint hairs with Christ, 
If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And that's so important there. Look, look at that verse again. And if children, then hairs, hairs of God, and joint hairs with Christ. Yeah, wonderful. But then it says, if so be that we suffer with him. So if we don't suffer with him and put on that mind, we have not ceased from sin and we, and, and, and we have not put off the lust of the flesh. You know, remember the first, um, first Peter chapter four, you know, it says that, you know, those who have suffered with Christ have ceased from the sin and that we no longer live according to the lusts of men. No, but to the will of God. And that's what the children of God do. That's what we do. That's how we have to live. That's the genuine salvation experience. It's very simple, very simple. Even a child could understand it. But the rebellious hearts of men who want to keep on sinning and doing the wrong thing and somehow be justified in their sin, turn the grace of God into licentiousness or lasciviousness. Um, so again, so if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And remember that Christ in us is the hope of glory. Isn't that being glorified together? Absolutely. Um, if we turn to 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, this is where I'm going to finish up in just a moment. It says, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves, even ye not, not, even ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be re reprobates. So examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. And that's what we have to do. We have to examine ourselves. Are we in this camp? Are we in this camp? There's only two ways to go. There's the way of life. And there's the way of death. There's the hearers and doers of the word. And there's the hearers and don'ts. You know, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. And Jesus, you know, he said to dig deep, count the cost. You know, follow him. Don't look back. Don't be like Lot and look back on the world. No, we, we're to flee that. And there's mercy for us if we will follow God. Um, in Romans chapter 8, it says, verse 39, it says, Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're to keep ourselves in the love of God. Nothing can separate us from it except ourselves. It doesn't say, it doesn't say that we can't. We can. We can walk away from it. But if we abide in that love and keep ourselves in there, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, in the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. Just grab onto that and abide in that and keep yourselves in the love of God. So I know, um, in First John chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, it says, And whoso keepeth his word, keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, Hereby know we that we are in him. He that, he that saith he abideth in him, or him, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. That's how we're to walk. And sorry for my tongue twisting there. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I'm still pretty new to actually making the videos and that. So just bear with me. But I'm just speaking from my heart to you. I really want people to come to a real knowledge of the truth. And in finishing up here, I'll just read Jude 121 again, the, the theme of this whole talk. And it's, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Thank you. If you sat through and, and watched this, thank you so much for listening. Um, if you've got any questions, just leave comments. I like, I like it when people leave comments because then I can answer them and we can have a discussion and work things out because there's only one truth there's not multiple truths and then we have our opinions and our understandings and we can err in in some things in confusion and but if we're honest and sincerely seeking the truth we will all come to a knowledge of what the real truth is and then we put our opinions aside and just yield ourselves to the truth and then we can come together in a unity of the faith so um again just thank you for watching and may jesus bless you and may the life of God just be shed, you know, abundant, just have that abundant life experience. Thank you.